All right. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Emily Bell. I'm the communications coordinator for the Florida Wildflower Foundation. And we're excited to have you here for From Bunkers to Butterflies, Conservation of South Florida's Lepidoptera at Zoo Miami's Butterfly Lab. For those of you not familiar with our organization, our mission is to protect, connect, and expand native wildflower habitats through our education, research, planting, and conservation programs. Our work is made possible primarily through the sales and renewals of the Florida State Wildflower License Plate. Here you can see our old design and of course our wonderful new design that's been on the road for many years now. These funds, along with donations and memberships, allow us to support and create projects that build awareness and knowledge of native wildflowers and plants throughout Florida. We'd like to encourage those of you who find our programs valuable to consider becoming a member, making a donation, or purchasing the state wildflower license plate. And if you purchase or have the wildflower plate, you're eligible for a membership. So just let us know you have the tag and we can get you set up in our membership database. Be sure also to check out our website for resources on planting and growing wildflowers, to learn where you can see wildflowers in bloom, follow our upcoming events, and so much more. Uh, we're also on social media, and you can find us on most platforms at FLA Wildflowers. Our next webinar, The Soil Food Web, will be presented by Ecological Landscape Designer and Soil Food Web Lab Technician Geo Devs on Wednesday, April 17th at 2 p.m. And this webinar will take us on an introductory journey through the world beneath our feet and explain the importance of restoring the microscopic ecosystems in our gardens. We also have some really great field trips coming up. Our next field trip is Saturday, April 20th at the Apalachicola Lowlands Preserve. Ryan Means of the Coastal Plains Institute, Institute will be our guide into the preserve, sharing how management practices have produced a botanical haven for many of the Florida panhandle's endemic, endangered, and threatened wildflowers. Um, we also, our May field trips are getting set up. We'll be at Rock Hill and Chipley on May 4th, and our popular wildflower farm tours in Alachua uh, will be May 11th and 12th. So be on the lookout for registration for those coming soon. Also, be sure to follow us on socials, subscribe to our newsletter, or check out our events page to stay up to date on everything we've got going on, because there's a lot more happening as well. Just some quick housekeeping before we get started. All attendees are muted with cameras off. If you have questions, please use the Q&A feature to submit them. The chat is active and you're welcome to uh, post comments and say hello there, but we are not monitoring it for questions. So please use the Q&A and we will address questions at the end of the talk. Um, and if your question is not answered, you can email it to info at flawildflowers.org. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website and YouTube channel in 24 to 48 hours. When it's available, you'll receive an email from us with a link to the recording, along with a resource page with links from the webinar. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Tiffany Moore graduated from North Carolina State University with a bachelor's degree in environmental sciences and two minors in entomology and outdoor leadership. After graduating, she worked in the agricultural biotechnology industry, assisting the development of genetically modified agricultural crops and pesticides. In 2019, she moved to Miami for the Butterfly Lab Specialist position at Zoo Miami and was accepted to the University of Florida's graduate program for forest resources and conservation. She'll finish her master, oh, and finished her master's degree in, 2020, in December, 2023. Tiffany has published life history papers on native Lepidoptera, continues to collaborate with partners on endangered butterflies in South Florida, and, and collaborates on research for the Miami tiger beetle with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. So without further ado, I am going to hand it over to Tiffany, and we're very excited to have her with us today. Hi, thank you so much. Let me just share the screen. Everyone can see that. Looks great, yes. Okay, good. Uh, so that was uh, quite the introduction. So um, I don't have to introduce myself. <laughs> um, 
Uh, my name is Tiffany. I work at Zoo Miami. I've been um, at the zoo for about four years now. And so I have a very unique role because I am uh, the only person at the zoo that really concentrates on invertebrates and butterflies. So to take you with me to the bunker here, uh, Zoo Miami was actually, uh, the area where Zoo Miami is was, was actually a Navy base during World War II. And so after World War II, the space was decommissioned to the county and uh, we moved our zoo from Crandon Park to this location now. And with that, we have some of these bunkers left over on property. And so this particular bunker sits in the middle of a Pine Rockland habitat. And because of its unique location, we can't actually uh, run any kind of electrical lines to the bunker. And so this means that everything was retrofitted with solar panels and a rain barrel. And so um, you can see that there's the two murals um, in the slide here, and we got grant funding last year to uh, get these murals painted by a local artist. And our hope is that we can start to implement some of these uh, VIP tours through uh, our zoo so that folks can uh, get to see the bunker um, through the VIP tour since regular guests uh, don't have access to this space. This is the same space where I've conducted my research. And so um, it's quite unique because um, as you can imagine, South Florida does get rain often. It also gets cloudy for multiple days. And so um, with that, it also comes the troubleshooting with uh, the solar power. And um, I may not have power for a day or so. Um, hopefully that's all fixed though, because we did get an upgraded system with our battery bank for our solar panels last fall. So fingers crossed that um, moving forward, we don't uh, run into the same issues. And then jumping right into it, um, Tropical milkweed is a big controversial topic to some. And so I wanted to start with that and then kind of go into some other areas of my work. So in 2022, we launched a tropical milkweed initiative here at the zoo. And so that meant that uh, we took out all of the tropical milkweed from the zoo. And uh, for those purposes, um, the tropical milkweed plant is a non-native plant, so it's not naturally occurring in the U.S. Um, the plant itself actually has chemicals within the, um, the, the plant anatomy that causes monarchs to break their diapause when, they're, when they are going through the great migration in the fall. Um, another study also shows that the tropical milkweed will entice the female butterflies to start laying eggs. So if they are on the migration and they come into contact with this plant, they will likely remain in that area where it was found and then start to immediately lay eggs. And so they never actually complete their full migration if they do come into Florida. Um, another study also shows that the tropical milkweed provides the wrong metabolism for the butterfly. And so that causes issues when the butterfly is flying long distances like that. And so um, the tropical milkweed plants just has a, a unique thing about it where it will cause all of these problems within the monarch that, we're, that we don't visually see. Um, so essentially um, what it means is that the, the caterpillars that are eating the tropical milkweed plant, they have to spend more energy in order to migrate. So some other information about the tropical milkweed, another study had showed that migratory monarchs overwintering, overwintering in California experience low infection risk compared to monarchs that are breeding year round on the non-native milkweeds. And so you might think that the caterpillars living longer would be a good thing, but in fact, it's actually um, a bad thing because they are spreading more parasites uh, because they are living longer. They're flying to other flowers 
a nectaring, they're visiting other milkweeds to lay eggs, and so they're just spreading more of the parasites there. Monarchs uh, don't fly as far as, as they are on native milkweeds, and so if you do have uh, monarchs that are feeding on tropical milkweed, they are not making it as far um, in their migration if they are eating that plant. And uh, they do have thinner and less elongated wings, which uh, also causes them to um, maybe have trouble in, in the flighting of their migration. So here are two different maps. On the left, this uh, map is uh, formulated by the University of Georgia, and they had sampled monarchs uh, with parasite loads from all across the U.S., but I just took a snapshot of what Florida looks like. And so essentially there's these kits that you can test your monarchs on, and so those samples were submitted to the University of Georgia. They looked at the parasite load of uh, those sample kits. And so where you see the darker circle is where the heavier abundance of parasites were located. And then the uh, lighter red and white circles are the areas of where uh, the parasite load was actually low. And then on the other side of the map, on the right side, I took a nat iNaturalist data from the website and I just took a blanket search for tropical milkweed locations in Florida. And this is what uh, the website gave me. So if you are not familiar with iNaturalist, it's a citizen scientist website. You can also have an app on your phone. You take a photo of any plant or animal and it documents where that, uh, that plant or animal was found. And so tropical milkweed has this map. And if you look back and forth, you can kind of see that there's a pattern here. So where tropical milkweed is located, you will also find heavy loads of the OE parasite. I also want to mention here that the OE parasite is a naturally occurring parasite that co-evolved with monarchs. However, when monarchs have a very heavy load, of the parasite, it causes them to have crippled wings, it causes them death, and sometimes they don't even close out as an adult butterfly. But if they have low amounts of parasites, they can still thrive as an adult butterfly, and they're not going to be as affected as they are uh, with the heavier loads. Um, also, the tropical milkweed provides uh, much more of the OE parasite load compared to native milkweeds in the U.S. Um, so in Miami-Dade County, where I am from, uh, we have 10 alternative milkweed plants for monarchs. So not all of them are going to be the true Asclepius uh, milkweeds. There are other ones that they will eat. Um, in, uh, in our Pine Rockland habitat, there is a a plant called metastelma. It's a tiny little vine. It also milks, uh, but it's not in the Asclepius uh, genus. And so even though that it's not in a, a true uh, milkweed, it still uh, can be consumed by monarchs. And so I wanted to recognize that um, there are alternatives to milkweed, not just uh, what we typically think of as Asclepius. Um, the unfortunate challenge here is that a lot of these milkweeds that are native are not commercially available. And so that provides a, uh, a challenge when people are very interested in trying to help the monarch and try to plant um, milkweeds for them. Um, but I want to also uh, mention that these are, this is a list of all of the um, imperiled and endangered butterflies in Florida. And so this list comes from the Miami Blue chapter of NABA, the, um, the Butterfly Association for the U.S. And so I made this list because I want to emphasize that there are many more butterflies and moths that are maybe not well known that need more help rather than the monarch. And I understand that um, many folks who were getting into butterfly gardening and just learning more about butterflies 
they want to, they easily recognize monarchs. And so they, that's the first thing that they gravitate towards. But I want to um, urge everyone else to kind of look at your particular area, see what other butterflies um, need help. Um, and then going forward into some of my, oh, uh, sorry, one more thing. Um, I did read that um, from an article from the University of Florida campus extension, there's uh, 665 species of butterflies found in uh, North America, north of Mexico. Florida has about 170 native butterfly species. So this list is just small to, um, to the imperiled and endangered butterfly species. But I wanted to also mention that because there's a lot of butterflies um, that are just not well known, um, at least in, in Florida. Okay, so moving on to my research side. So this is the first species that I published on. This is the faithful beauty moth. It's a diurnal moth species, which means that it flies during the day. It's often mistaken for a butterfly as well because it has these bright colors. And you can see it flying during the day. So I did a research project on the species where I got permits to collect um, the eggs from the natural preserve. And then I documented each individual as they grew, measured their uh, larval growth and how many instars that they were actually going through. And so with this research, we were able to discover four new host plants. So the Blodgett's swallowworts, which is the metastoma one that I just mentioned earlier, Highland alamanda, Actually, there's a milkweed, a tuberosa milkweed that this species will eat, as well as a white twine vine. And so as I was going through the caterpillar um, uh, individuals and, and looking at how they were behaving and everything like that, we did notice that some of the caterpillars had five instars and some of the other caterpillars went through six instars. And what instar means is that it's a segment of the caterpillar life. And so uh, it would go through five or six instars before it becomes a pupa. And then from pupa, it becomes the adult butterfly or moth. And so with my research, we documented that uh, this uh, moth species lasted 41, um, about 41 days. And so um, it's kind of an extended, um, this is not including the adult um, time span as well. And so they could live longer as an adult. I released them once I, um, when they got to that stage. Similarly, we did another research project with the lesser wasp moth. It's a diurnal species as well. And so with this one, there was much, um, there was not a lot of information known about this species. And so we, the only literature that had documented its host plant as quailberry, but nothing really more. And I had the first observation of this species consuming maidenberry in the wild. Um, maidenberry is also a relative to quailberry. It's also more relevant in the nurseries. So I was able to purchase maidenberry in order to feed the caterpillars in my lab. And um, it also had a variance in the number of larval instars. This species lasted a little bit longer in their life cycle. And then um, what was important to me is that I collected 44 individuals from the wild in three different pair groups, and then ultimately was able to release 136 adults back into the wild. That is That part in itself is really important to me. I don't want to take a, a individual from the wild and then have something go wrong. And so I really wanted to limit how many I took from the wild and then how much I put back into the environment. So this is another species that is an imperiled butterfly. Um, there's not a lot of information known about this butterfly as well. Um, the Florida dusky wing um, is only really known to consume the locust berry plant primarily. It can also be found on Barbados cherry, but maybe it's not a preferred plant for them. And while researchers were doing some um, initial surveys for this species, what they found is that 
in a lot of the surveys, they were being mistaken for the horse's dusky wing. They are very, very similar. They're both the same color. Um, what the difference is, is that um, if you can see the, the small white dots on the upper part of the wing, um, a dusky wing will have four and a horse's dusky wing will only have three. And so um, it's a quite small um, characteristic for these butterflies and without close focus binoculars, maybe you can't see it or maybe they don't stay still long enough for you to take a look. And so during initial surveys, they were mistaken for the horse's dusky wing. And what that tells the scientists is that maybe the Florida dusky wing is much more imperiled, if not endangered, uh, than we had thought before. Um, this is a, a butterfly species that is kind of common around the zoo, actually. We kind of have the, a unique situation because we have so much of the locust berry here. Um, but our partners at Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden um, also give away locust berry as part of their uh, their native plant network. And so essentially they are trying to create these, um, these hopping stones for homeowners so that as they plant more of the host plant around the county, hopefully the butterfly will make its way to have a larger range than being restricted into the natural areas. And something that's kind of unique about this butterfly is that the males are territorial. So you will see a male will kind of hang out around a locust berry and as a female flies by, he will kind of chase after her and try to court with her. Um, the locust berry plant is also very unique because it, because it is only pollinated by the centrus bee and uh, the berries on the plant are dispersed by the imperiled Florida box turtle. So this is just a full circle moment for these all of these species. You have an imperiled butterfly, you have an imperiled uh, bee, a native bee, and you have an imperiled Florida box turtle. So when one of these pieces of the puzzle goes missing, it can uh, impact the rest of them as well. So that's really important to keep in mind when um, you're doing conservation work, especially with, um, with imperiled species. So this is a um, in federally endangered butterfly that we have here on property, the Bartram Scrub Hair Street Butterfly. It is restricted to certain areas of pine rockland habitat. I believe we are the most um, northern site uh, that has Bartrams um, at the moment. Uh, and so last summer I did a REU program with the students. So REU stands for Research Experience for Undergraduate Students. So I was a mentor for, um, for one student and she went out to different areas of the Pine Rockland around the zoo. We did uh, randomized uh, mapping. So she went to uh, different points that were uh, laid out off of a GPS unit. And then she counted the number of croton plants uh, around in a five meter radius, as well as um, looking at at least 10 of the croton plants to search for any caterpillars or eggs for, the, for this species. And so we also characterize the habitat, meaning how open is the canopy? How many pine trees are in the immediate area? How many palm trees or how much pine duff layer are there, is there on the ground? Um, all of these kind of impact the uh, small habitat of where Bartrams would choose to lay an egg on, on the croton plants. And so we also uh, did surveys for how many crab spiders were on the croton plants. Crab spiders are known to be a predator for caterpillars. Um, so that was also important to document. Um, they could also be consuming other small insects that are on the plant as well. They could maybe they're eating small flies or anything else that visits the the plants themselves. So it's not only the barchums that they would consume. But out of the whole summer and out of all of the surveying that my student had completed, uh, she completed two hundred and forty one croton plant surveys, and out of that, we only found fourteen eggs and two larvae. So. Granted, we did not survey the entire Pine Rockland area around the zoo. We only selected six particular units to uh, do surveys in, 
and those surveys were based off of um, how often that site had been uh, prescribed burned, how often that was maintained by our natural areas management through Miami-Dade County and so forth. Some of the areas around the zoo had not been burned in 20 years. Um, other areas had burned in the last year. So we had a variance in um, the management for the different particular units around the zoo. And so it is striking to see we've only found 14 eggs and two larvae. This should be ringing the bell to say that Bartrams are in danger here. Um, they do have some seasonality. During the summer, we may not find as many adults, um, which is why we may have found more eggs and larvae. And so um, there may be that part of the seasonality. Maybe we're not surveying um, during the right time to find adults and whatnot. But I still think that it is vital to continue to do these surveys and see if we can get year-long data and see how that correlates with the data that we provided last summer. And all of the information that we collected, I also forwarded to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and FWC, Florida Fish and Wildlife, so that they were aware of um, the situation as well. So some of my partnerships also come with um, the University of Florida and Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden. And so I have the unique uh, position where I'm able to do butterfly surveys for our partners as well. And so Dr. Jared Daniels at the McGuire Center of Lepidoptera in Gainesville is a great partner of ours. He relies on me as well to do some of these surveys uh, for Miami Blue Butterfly and the Shalsa Swallowtail Butterfly. Both of these butterflies are federally endangered. They both live in the Florida Keys. And climate change is a, a huge concern for everyone because we know that some of their habitat is disappearing. And so luckily with the Shalsa Swallowtail, they have bounced back um, in greater numbers in recent years. There was one particular year where they surveyed and only found four adults total out of the whole summer. And so that prompted them to do an immediate permit access so that they could collect an, a female. She laid eggs on a, a potted uh, plant, um, uh, which is called porchwood, and they were able to take those eggs back to the University of Florida where they started to breed this butterfly in, in the hope that they could start to release those butterflies again. Then in, in the subsequent years after that, they released many butterflies, tested uh, many different um, aspects of how to release them, in what ways worked best. And they also had graduate students do projects with the Shasta Swallowtail as well. And so in the past couple of years, the, the surveys for this particular butterfly uh, was at its, at its highest. Uh, Miami Blue Butterfly um, is probably more concerning um, for its population status. There's only a couple of places left where it has been seen naturally in the Florida Keys. And the Florida um, uh, University of Florida is continuing to try and work with U.S. Fish and Wildlife to um, try to release these butterflies in other areas outside of uh, the Keys so that um, in the event that a hurricane comes, they are not uh, going to go extinct, that there is some kind of reassurance population that we could still hold on to and, and try to get these guys um, in, in the mainland of Florida. This is a butterfly guide that the zoo developed with me. And so um, we connected with Fairchild um, as well to help develop some of the photos and, and the guidance of the, of the butterfly guide here. And so we specifically chose butterfly plants that are either a nectar plant or a host plant. And so um, what that means is that the host plant is the plant that the caterpillar will eat and a nectar plant is what the adult butterfly consumes its nectar from. In order to have a good popu or a good butterfly garden, you have to have both of those things present in your yard. So I think some people often forget um, the, the host plants. They wanna plant the flowery plants that look great, 
but they often forget in order to have an entire life cycle of a butterfly, you have to have the host plant as well. So we developed this guide that we have on our zoo website. It's free to download just from the zoo website. And so um, it's mainly for Miami-Dade County though. So I see that some people are from out of state. So unfortunately this guide is not too helpful for you all, but um, I would encourage you to also look at some other resources in your state and see what plants are native to your particular area. And with that, I um, can, I can answer questions um, or if I can move the slide one more time, um, this is a QR code for uh, the butterfly guide if anybody wants to download. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, so we feel free if you have questions, now would be a great time to put them in the Q&A. We've had a few come through that we've been able to provide some answers and resources for. Um, Tiffany, a few questions. Um, one person is curious, you mentioned at the very beginning that you're hoping to um, have VIP tours in the bunker. Do you have any ETA for that? I don't actually. Um, we, we've been wanting to do this for quite some time, to be honest. And um, we are having a little difficulty trying to provide staff to do those tours. Because the bunker is in the middle of the woods, mm -hmm. it takes a little while to get out there by a golf cart. Um, that also means that the golf cart is going to be limited to a certain amount of people. And so um, it would only be available through paid VIP tours. Um, hopefully sometime this year we can implement it, but I really don't have a start date. Okay, no worries, thank you. Um, you mentioned working with Dr. Jarrett Daniels, who is out of the um, UF Florida Museum. Um, there was a question about whether or not you worked with them. Can you expand a little on that partnership? Sure. So. Um, I, I was actually accepted to uh, do my PhD through UF. And so Dr. Jared Daniels is also my PhD advisor. Um, and so I'll be continuing on with the Bartram's butterfly as well for my PhD. Um, I'll probably touch on the Miami tiger beetle as well. Um, and so in partnerships, um, I do a lot of the surveys um, for him uh, or with his team at, at times because they're stationed in Gainesville and in South Florida, a lot of the surveys are done in the Florida Keys or different preserves around South Florida. And so it's easier for me to travel from South Florida to go to those preserves rather than some of his lab team um, in Gainesville to travel South. He does have one person from the lab that is stationed in the Florida Keys. So it is his responsibility to do uh, surveys in the Florida Keys. He will go out on a boat often and a survey for Miami Blue at the different, um, different islands where the host plants are available there. And so I have gone out with them on the boat and did surveys in the Keys for the Miami Blue. I've also done the Shell Swallowtail surveys in the summer. And so that's kind of the extent of it. Um, we did have a bigger survey project with Miami Blue Butterfly. So me and a colleague from Fairchild surveyed different preserves around the west and east coast of South Florida. And we were looking for particular areas of where uh, the, poten the highest potential for Miami Blue could be put out. So what we were looking for was how many host plants were available, how many nectar plants were available. And then we kind of made a grading system and so we, uh, as a lab and, and consulting with Fish and Wildlife, we can we considered a particular preserve that we've been looking at. And so uh, we're continuing to try and monitor that particular preserve. Great, and congrats on the PhD program. That's exciting. Thank um, you. So a few questions related to the milkweed. Um, let's see. Do you, is there anything you would recommend in the way of reporting? So someone has mentioned that they see tropical milkweed in parks in Miami-Dade County. Should they report that? Um, or how do they kind of let people know about that? Yeah, so I'm not sure who would they, who they would report it to. Um, 
you can put it on iNaturalist so that it's documented that it was actually there because it will have a photo capability. Um, unfortunately, some of the parks in Miami-Dade County still continue to put out tropical milkweed. Um, it's much easier to obtain in nurseries. And sometimes I think that there's a little guidance for tropical milkweed. And so they just choose it because they think that that's the right plant to go with. But um, unfortunately, um, I'm one person and I don't know that they know who I am sometimes. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, can you expand, you mentioned that there were other plants beyond just the Asclepius genus that the monarchs would host on. Can you share what some of those are? Sure, so the, um, let me see if I can go back here on the slide. Um, oh, wait. Okay, so um, this, so this species of moth right here, this uses the blodget swallow wart. Uh, Metastoma blodgetii is the scientific name. I have that written in the note um, for my presentation. So that's one of the plants that uh, the monarchs uh, can eat in the preserve. It's also a a plant species is probably not found in nurseries because it's um, a small little vine. Um, the white twine vine, which is Funistrum awesome, um, that is, uh, I don't know if it has like showy flowers, but it is a vine. It can grow on a trellis. Um, if you break a leaf off, it still has the same milky substance as milkweeds. Um, but those two, in, those two specifically, um, the, the monarch can use. Um, I do have a list uh, saved on my laptop. So if you're interested in, in, a, in the full list of the Miami-Dade County um, alternative milkweed species, I can provide that list uh, later on. Okay, great. Yeah, I would imagine, so milkweed is in the Apocynaceae family, so probably within that family there are suitable hosts. All right, let's see. Um, question about the, sh the Shaw's butterfly. You mentioned that its population has increased. Has this been limited to BNP only? Is that Biscayne National Park? I'm not sure. Um, and have they shown an increased dispersal range to other islands? So they're in, uh, they have a probably bigger range than Miami blue butterfly. So when I would do surveys, I would normally go to on Penny Camp. And so they are um, along that stretch down there. Um, um, there's a few other places as well. I think there's a Nike missile launch site that, you, that used to be used for military. Now it's just a preserve. Um, so there's different areas along that, that key there where they're still found. Um, so I don't think that it's necessarily limited to that. What would BNP, is that, where would that be? Biscayne National Park, I believe. Um, I, I think they're also further south. Okay, great, thank you. Um, if someone were to find one of these rare endangered butterflies while they were out, how should they report that? Or, or should they? And and if so, what's the best? Um, to do? Good question. There there might be a way to report that through um, Florida Fish and Wildlife Service um, or U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I'll try to look to see if I can find links to to the reporting that I can send you, and then you can share with everyone. Um, there's also EFNI, which is the Florida area's natural inventory group. Um, they also collaborate a lot with the University of Florida and I they might have a reporting system as well. Okay, if, you, if you do take photos of an endangered species and you upload it to iNaturalist, it will automatically block the location um, because they don't want uh, poachers for any of the endangered species. So just keep that in mind as well. And I do know that FNA, um, they monitor some of the species that they're monitoring on INAT. So if you do put it in INAT, 
oftentimes they they can see it there as well. Yes, that's correct. Okay, great. And then um, the last question we have is um, someone was wondering if you could briefly share the differences between a butterfly and a moth. That's a good question. I feel like I have been, you know, kind of pushed into the moth world um, um, by happenstance. And so um, when you have a moth that's diurnal, it flies during the day. So people often mistake it for a butterfly. But some of the key differences is their antennae. And so um, you'll often see, um, even on the screen here, this is the Faithful Beauty Moth. You'll, you can kind of see how fluffy the antennae are um, for this species. And then for the other one, this lesser wasp moth, um, you see how fluffy the antennae are. So if you typically think of like a bird feather and you stick it to your head, that's what a mouth would look like. Um, normally we think of butterflies uh, collecting nectar and flying during the day, but there's always the, um, the, um, the individuals that, the exception to the rule, some of the individuals will fly during, during the, the day as well. Also, somehow they um, present their wings. So when a butterfly lands on a flower, they will often fold up their wings backwards and maybe open their wings to uh, bask in the sun and they will fold their wings. Um, but a moth typically will not do that. A moth will typically keep their wings outward like an airplane. Um, so those are some of the, the key differences some of the moth species actually do not have proboscis, which is um, the scientific term for tongues. And so their sole purpose is to, um, to just mate and then pass away. And so they spend all of their energy in a caterpillar form, and then they don't nectar or anything as an adult. So those are, um, that's some of the uh, tiger moth group. That's what they present as. That's so interesting. So the moth, uh, the moth antennae are uh, fuzzy, and the butterflies are just kind of narrow and slender. Yeah. So the the butterfly antennae are narrow, slender. Um, there's a couple of different forms of butterfly antennae, so they can have kind of like a a ball at the end, or it could be called um, clubbed, and so they kind of curve a little at the end. Um, but typically, yeah, the butterflies will have straight, narrow. And Tenny. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Um, and again, for everybody, this was recorded and um, we'll get those resources from Tiffany and share those. You'll get an email from us when all of that is available. So uh, thanks again to everyone joining and Tiffany, and we hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you.